Once again, visiting with former NASA engineering executive Dwayne Dietz on this edition of Republic Theory. It is great to have you along. Uh, I'm Dallas Andrews along with Warren Dyson. We're discussing the events of September 11 and really honing in on on Manhattan as um, obviously we all remember what we were doing on that day. It's one of those things that you, that you, you never truly forget. We're visiting with Dwayne Dietz, former NASA engineering executive on this week's edition of Republic Theory on Jackalope 105 FM. Dwayne, I wanted to back up, I believe it was to Pillar 1, and discuss the uh, the, the symmetry um, aspect of the damage, because I've tried to offer this, I guess, analogy or visual, I guess it's more of a visual, uh, because you mentioned um, the asymmetrical damage sustained by uh, both of the Twin Towers, and that obviously means that the damage was not even. They're, they're you know, square buildings, essentially, so one side didn't receive the same damage as the other. Provided that we did have the temperatures necessary to melt or even soften steel, as, as some keep falling back on, enough to create some kind of catastrophe, wouldn't it have been more reasonable to see in the instance of World Trade Center Tower 1, maybe the top half of the building maybe lean over and break off or something to that effect? Yes, in fact, I would say that would be true for both Tower 1 and Tower 2. Uh, Tower 1, let me just talk about the difference in the airplane strikes for the two towers. On Tower 2, which was the second airplane to strike, the airplane angled through kind of open office space and out the other side and missed most of the core columns. In fact, it might have missed them all. I'm not sure. So if there was any melting of structure, it wouldn't have been any primary core column structure. It would have been off to the side somewhere. And it would be very asymmetrical, just kind of over on the on the side. So for that to immediately lead, lead to a symmetrical severing of a whole floor and therefore a symmetrical uh, free fall into the path of greatest resistance below it, uh, it just does, it's against the law of physics. If you go to Tower 1, the first airplane to strike, it was not this glancing path through office areas, but rather it was directly into the core columns. Well, it went through a little bit of office space, but it went into the core columns head on. And so that's a very different pattern of damage in that tower. Yet the two towers came down symmetrically. You can hardly tell the difference with the exception of the initial damage to Tower 2, which was a lower airplane strike, was to have the top of the building tilt over to the side. And so that was asymmetrical tilt, but it then kind of destroyed destroyed itself before it continued falling. So it became, it went from being kind of an asymmetrical tilt to being a totally symmetrical uh, destruction the rest of the way down. Dwayne, I wanted to revisit something here on Pillar 4 uh, when it has to do with the uh, iron uh, and the other thermite byproducts that you uh, mentioned, uh, fluorine, uh, aluminum, manganese, things like that. Um, I've had a lot of challenges, well, not a lot, but a few challenges, as far as people saying that these these uh, small molten uh iron uh, spheres, that type of thing, could have been a byproduct of the cleanup process when they're using torches to, to cut the beams and that kind of thing. Uh, now, from your perspective, what is it about these little spheroids that makes them absolutely not able to be a byproduct of the cleanup process? Well, the strongest reason is that one of the samples of dust was collected 10 minutes after the tower uh, nearby went down, which was before any cleanup operations began. And the four samples of dust, and they were collected from different parts of Manhattan, were very consistent with each other. So we have kind of a time stamp within 10 minutes of the building coming down 
that is consistent with other dust. So that that by itself rules out any cleanup operations as contributing here. And uh, I did want to ask, uh, what can you tell us about NIST? Uh, this organization now, now throughout the course of the show, we've referenced NIST, uh, we've talked about the NIST reports, but um, honestly, I believe we haven't done necessarily a service to our listeners by explaining what NIST is. Could you advise us what makes up NIST? Okay, NIST is stands for National Institute for Standards and Technology. It's a government laboratory within the Department of Commerce. It used to be called the Bureau of Standards, but they changed their name somewhere along the line. And they were given a charter in 2002, October of 2002, the charter to study the buildings. And it was written, and this is by the Congress and signed by the President. So their commission or charter to study these buildings and determine what should be done in in the way of improving safety. That was kind of the emphasis of that charter. And a lot of what they came out with is recommendations for improved building codes that would enhance safety. But all of their study really was trying to understand what went on, uh, supposedly. On the one that really dragged out was their study of Building 7, and it wasn't until 2008, August of 2008, that they finally came out with what they called their final draft report, and then they called for public comments at that time, and then issued their final report in November of 2008, uh, about a week or so after the general election. They had come out with earlier reports draft reports and their final report on the Twin Towers was I can't remember the exact year probably 2005 and they only went to the initiation of collapse so they really didn't analyze at all any of of how the building came down itself they basically stopped short of all of that In the NIST report about uh, World Trade Center 7's collapse, uh, I had heard that they had essentially admitted to the free fall speed timings that uh, that a lot of us have been aware of and that they kind of confirmed that in their report. Uh, But I'm afraid I didn't ever find out how they explained away the timings being, being accurate for a free fall and yet not explaining away that total removal of structure that you were talking uh, that you were talking about that would be necessary to achieve that type of thing uh, in your investigations into uh, the NIST report have you seen where they were able to successfully explain that away well no I don't think that they did explain it uh, what happened is they were claiming up through their August of 2008 draft report that the building was 40 came down 40 percent slower than free fall so they made quite a change between august and november where they in november said it was pure free fall for two little over two seconds and what they explained is that there were three phases to the collapse the first phase our stage i guess used word stage the first stage was some things starting to move, and they picked some initial point, which is the, basically we're not sure what they were looking at when they started the clock and count, and started from zero. And then they got to stage two, and that was what they said was free fall. And then they had stage three, which was the remaining time. What they ended up doing then, and this is in November, final report, they looked at that total time between the start of stage one and the end of stage three, and they said that total time, which I think was 5.4 seconds, 5.6, can't remember, that was the same time as their analysis 
their computer models had shown. And they therefore concluded that that was in good agreement. But what we know of their computer models is they did not include any mechanism that would explain the free fall part of it. So they, they basically ended up kind of glossing over it and saying, aha, we have 